All right, let's get started. I know my concrete design folks might need a second to just breathe. And that concrete design just had an exam, so, or a celebration, celebration. celebration. All right, all right, so I, because of uh, what I expected to happen with just getting everything prepared and ready for senior design, I did not have time to finish grading your exams, so I don't have your exam grades. Uh, goal is to return those on Friday, but again, especially for the majority of you who are in senior design, you know that that sort of took precedence. Yes? Usually, I, I turn them on like as I'm giving them out. So, But I will say this, um, because we have so many people in steel design, there's a good chance that you know, I might start handing the exams out in concrete design uh, and maybe even some in senior design if everybody's there, just just to make that go faster. Because otherwise, I'd, I'd be sitting here all day, you know, running, you know, and that's not very efficient. Okay, everybody good? All right, now, I want to make sure that we're clear on housekeeping. So again, you have a homework assignment due Monday. Uh, on Monday, you are then, everybody, shh, pay attention, pay attention. Uh, we have a homework assignment due on Monday, and then Monday you're going to get uh, the first of two beam homeworks, uh, one on continuously braced beams. That's going to be due not that next Wednesday, but the following Wednesday on the 24th. And then you get your final homework on discreetly braced beams on the 24th, and then those uh, assignments, or that assignment's due on May 3rd. And then that's steel design other than your, your final. So just so um, everybody's clear on that. Okay. Everybody good? Okay. All right. So um, before we jump into the notes, um, I want to sort of recap where we left off last time, and I really want to make sure that everybody understands um, uh, what I have here on the board and what's, what's going to be coming for the next uh, couple weeks. Um, I'd argue that one of the most fundamental skills of a civil engineer, at least somebody that's uh, uh, choosing to go down a little bit of a, a structural path, is to understand how to design a steel beam. It's, it's a pretty fundamental uh, 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 ability. Uh, it's also pretty straightforward if you have a, a, a sound conceptual understanding uh, of what's going on. And so I put here uh, an image on the board, and this is just sort of generic. It's not anything to um, uh, write home about. But what I have is just some random beam with some set of loads on it. They could be dead loads. They could be live loads. They could be snow loads. They could be whatever. And uh, they could be point loads, distributed loads. It, it doesn't really matter, okay? And the beam is, we'll say, L long. Now, you need to understand the length of the beam and the loads in order to get one side of the equation, which is essentially MU, your, your factored moments, right? And so if we had a simply supported beam with, say, a uniformly distributed load, our moment would be, say, WL squared over 8, and the W would be, you know, maybe 1.2 times dead plus 1.6 times alive. And for those of you that have had concrete design, you, that's, that's old hat, okay? The big thing that I want to get across and I want to make sure that, that everybody understands is what about the other side of the equation, phi MN, okay? Phi MN is not so much a function of the beam's length, but the beam's unbraced length. In other words, the space between those braces that frame in. Okay? And remember, those braces can be from a number of different sources. Let me, um, let me go back to that slide because I think that's kind of, this is a, a really critical point. All right? So, you know, we could have, you know, a, a, a floor slab uh, uh, acting compositely with a beam. We could have, um, we could have floor beams framing into the, uh, uh, into the element that serve to brace it laterally. And we could also have something like a cross frame in a bridge. Brace links, and I just put four on there. You could have 100 on them. Uh, it doesn't really matter. Um, when we compute and when we look at capacities uh, in this class, I'm trying to take it a step at a time. So the first sort of like part one of beam design is going to be considering uh, continuously braced beams. In other words, cases where LB equals zero. So if you, can, if you want to think of um, 
uh, that conceptually. Imagine that there were, you know, you had a beam like this and you had an infinite number of cross frames bracing it laterally and not letting the beam move uh, left to right. The only thing that the beam can do uh, is deflect downward. And so in those cases, we say that LB equals zero. And if you want to compute the capacity, uh, it's pretty easy. You just take phi times Fy times Zx. That is the absolute maximum capacity that a steel beam can withstand. And that is always the case. And I want that also to be very crystal clear. And that'll, that we'll, we'll hammer that in uh, quite a bit over the next few lectures. But the long and short is I don't care what's going on, whether the beam's going to buckle or not buckle or what have you. The absolute maximum capacity of a beam is its uh, plastic moment capacity, uh, Fy times Zx. And that'll always be the case. Now, for discreetly braced beams, discreetly braced beams generally can have capacities smaller than that. And that's about, I think, the, the most accurate way I can state it right now without getting too far down the, the rabbit hole in terms of the math and, uh, and what have you. So for now, what I'll say is this. I'll say that phi mn is just something that we're going to figure out later. But uh, that, that'll, be, that'll be something we take care of uh, down the line. So for now, we're going to be handling cases where the uh, capacity is pretty straightforward. Later on, we'll, we'll get uh, a little more refined. So does everybody kind of have an idea of where this is headed, you know, from beginning to end? Any questions? Okay. So the big thing uh, to take away is making sure that everybody has a clear understanding of the difference between how long a beam is and what a beam's LB is. LB is the distance between those bracing elements that if the beam is going this way from, let's say, the whiteboard to the back of the room, if the beam is going this way, the lateral bracing elements come in perpendicular and prevent it from moving uh, left to right. Uh, and so the LB is the distance between those elements. Okay. All right. So uh, going back to the spec, uh, again, um, we're going to be having three different chapters that we're ultimately going to be looking at. When I say looking at, I mean, it's not like, you know, once you understand how to compute the capacity of a regular old everyday uh, steel beam, it's not like you're going to be staring uh, at the spec, but there are some provisions in there you need to be made uh, aware of. Uh, so we're going to be looking at three separate chapters, the chapter on bending, the chapter on shear, and the chapter on deflections or serviceability. So that's chapter F, chapter G, and chapter L. Um, as for shears, moments, and deflections, again, there's that uh, 3-208. That's the, uh, the guide in the manual that will tell you what the shears, moments, and deflections are for very basic loading scenarios. So I'm, uh, I think everybody in here should have a pretty good uh, idea uh, of, first off, how to derive these, but second, uh, how to use them, especially if you've had uh, st uh, concrete design. Uh, we did that. We use those uh, pretty extensively in there. Um, I, I spoke about local buckling a little bit last time. I'm actually going to sort of gloss over it a bit now because we're going to have an example today where uh, if that is a little confusing, the example today will, uh, will definitely uh, illuminate uh, what's going on. Okay, so part one, we're going to be talking about continuously braced beams. Okay, so for a beam that's continuously braced, its capacity is MP, its plastic moment capacity. So. Uh, MP is just Fy times Zx, that's your plastic section modulus, and phi is 0.9. For bending, phi is always going to be 0.9. And that's a sharp difference between what you do in concrete design. Remember, in concrete design, if you have a beam that's, uh, you know, you have a section under bending, and it's like, what is phi? Well, it depends. Remember, you'd have to comp you had to compute the strain in the uh, reinforcement steel and then figure out, well, if that strain was bigger than 0 0.005, that meant your phi was 0.9. But if not, you had that transition region. For those of you that are in concrete now, you know exactly what I'm talking about. If it's been a while for you, I know that's probably, you know, tugging at the old memory banks uh, a bit. But fortunately for steel, phi values are pretty easy. They're just lookups. So phi is always going to be 0.9 uh, for bending. So our capacity is phi, Fy, Zx. Now just so, I mean, I, I know we're, we're getting to basics here, but I just want to make sure everybody's clear on this. Your yield stress, you know, when you look up a yield stress, the units are typically KSI, you know, 50 KSI, 70 KSI, 36 KSI, what have you. 
And a plastic section modulus is uh, typically, when you look that up or when you compute it, it's usually in something like cubic inches. You know, Zx is 500 inches to the third. So if you just take Fy times Zx, you get a moment that's in inch kips. Okay? And typically that's a little different from your analysis, which is in foot kips. So just make sure that you're handling your units uh, appropriately. Okay. Now, we also looked last time at the continuously braced uh, beam design uh, uh, aid that's uh, present in the manual. And that's table 3-2. Whether we look at continuously braced beams or we look at discreetly braced beams, we will be using this table pretty much for the rest of the semester. So if it's not tabbed, uh, I would. I would argue that if anything regarding beams, this is one of the two most important uh, aids that you will use. The other is the, uh, uh, the beam charts which we'll be using later for discreetly braced beams. Um, the reason why this aid is used for both is because when you compute discreetly braced beam capacity, it is a function of a number of quantities that are listed in this table, like these two anchor lengths, LP and LR, like a function of the uh, uh, VMR uh, value and the beam factor. We'll talk about that uh, later. So this is a very, very useful guide. We also talked about the anatomy of it, how the sections are organized. Remember, they're organized according to ZX. Be careful when you're using this because there is a similar table for ZY, and it looks like exactly the same. So just make sure that you're looking uh, at, uh, at the ZX table. The ZX table is if the beam is being bent about its major axis, which is typically how you would want a beam uh, to be bent. So what I mean by that is if, you know, if I'm walking along a beam, I'm walking along the beam such that my feet are on top of the flange, right? So the flange is like this and the web is like that. I'm bending it about its strong axis, about the x-axis. If I were to turn the beam like this to where I was walking along the web, that would be bending the beam in weak axis bending. If you're looking at floor beams in buildings, they're never oriented uh, along the weak axis. They're always oriented along the strong axis. The only time you'd ever really care about weak axis bending is if you were looking at a column, let's say in a building, you were looking at wind, like wind hitting a building. Wind doesn't care which way the building's face is going to blow, whichever way it's going to blow. So that's when you would actually care about weak axis bending, but uh, for, for our purposes, uh, you want to restrict that to ZX. Okay, sound good? Uh, and remember, they're organized according to ZX and they're, they're uh, listed in groups. The top section is always the bolded section. Uh, in those groups because it's the one within that group that has the largest ZX value and it is the lightest. So if you look at these uh, uh, sections here on the slide, of this group of, I don't know, something like eight or not, eight, was it eight, one, eight uh, sections, the W33 by 130 is the one that is the lightest. Okay, so that's, so you might only need a ZX of like 430, but you're going to pick that one because it's uh, the lightest. Okay, sound good? All right. Any one gripe or any one complaint about the steel specification, it would be this. Um, moments are covered in Chapter F. Shears are covered in Chapter G. Um, deflections are covered in Chapter L. Everybody turn to this. I, I think this is kind of important. Turn to Chapter L. So 16.1-165. I want you all to see this, because I know everybody brought their AISC 15th edition steel construction manual to class, right? Hey, how's it going? How's it going? High five. Because you have your, you don't have your ASC 15th edition steel control. Well, no, no, but but what if he was back there? You might you might have an art. Uh, Y'all might, I'm not, bring your manual. All right. Um, this is one section in the spec that's actually kind of kind of strange. I think um, if you go to chapter F or chapter G, it tells you very explicitly. Here is the capacity of the beam. Here is how strong the beam is, and so on and so forth. If, but this is literally all the spec says in terms of deflections. 
Um, deflections in structural members and structural systems shall be limited so they don't impair the serviceability of the structure. Great. That's a lot of help. Right? That's literally all the spec says. And it's, it's sort of a different philosophy from concrete design. And so th this is really sort of the one, one thing I wish that, that, that uh, would sort of get codified. And it's just something that's, that's evolved over years and years and years of spec development. And so let me explain. If you open up the concrete spec, if you open up ACI 318, it very explicitly tells you what the deflection limits are. It says, if you have a, a floor beam that is connected to elements that are likely to be damaged, your deflection is limited to this. And it'll say something like L over 480. And so it tells you as the engineer, here's what I'm looking at, here's my limit. And that's it, okay? But steel design doesn't really do that. They actually leave it open. They don't list a specific limit in the spec, okay? And the reason why they're doing that, it's just sort of a different philosophy, is um, the steel industry basically says, well, they're giving the engineer the freedom to figure out with the client what the deflection limit should be. And so, so it's not something that's set in stone. The idea is that that might change from project to project. So if you open up the steel manual looking for a limit on deflection, you won't find one. Okay? It just says the deflection should be limited so they don't impair the serviceability of the structure. So it's a little bit open-ended. Now, there is one thing that is true or, or, or is uh, uh, something that should be keyed in, and that's the word serviceability. Okay? It does say that deflections should not be limit or sh shouldn't uh, impair the serviceability of the structure. Now, serviceability is a different consideration than strength. Okay? The reason why we take our dead loads and live loads and factor them, the reason why we take the dead load and multiply it by 1.2, and we take the live load and we multiply it by 1.6, is because when we're doing those checks, we're talking about structural safety. We're saying things like, if we violate this limit, the building is going down. You know, if, we're, if your grandma is driving over that bridge and we start violating that limit, your grandma is going to be in the river. And we don't want grandma in the river. So we take the dead loads and we up them 20% and the live loads and we up them 60% so that, so that the structural safety is maintained. But serviceability is a different check altogether. Serviceability is just trying to understand the overall day-to-day -day performance. If a beam deflects too much, like if it bends too much, yeah, it sucks, but it doesn't mean the building's falling down. Okay? It's not the same story. So the big thing to keep in mind is that when you're doing deflection checks, you use service loads. And what does that mean? You don't factor. You don't apply 1.2 and 1.6. You just add the loads up. Okay? For those of you in concrete design, we just did that. So. Um, you, you all just got a first-hand experience of that not 10 minutes ago, because that's what was on the exam. Okay. Sound good? All right. Now, just because there aren't, um, uh, you know, codified limits in the spec doesn't mean that you as engineers are completely, you know, without guidance. Okay? And there's, I, I'm going to get a little bit on my soapbox. There's something I should mention. Um, you are students. As students, you have access to getting an AISC student membership, and it's free. Okay? And as a student, you can get, if you're, you're an AISC member, you can actually download these steel design guides for free. Okay? And that might not seem like something that is all that important to you right now, but if you graduate and you go into a, a field where you're doing steel design, to give you like each, I don't know how much each of these guides cost, but if you had to buy all of them, they're pretty expensive. I mean, they're, they're, I mean, because there's something like 20 or 30 of them. There's all sorts of uh, of, uh, of different uh, design guides, and each of these guides cover a specific topic in steel design that's known to be kind of challenging. You know, like encase columns or uniform force method for brace connections, stuff that. You know, builds on you know what you fundamentally uh, uh, learn from an undergraduate steel design course, but takes a little bit of uh, uh, getting used to. Like design guide nine is a really popular one, which is how do you handle torsion? How do you handle stuff being twisted uh, in in steel? And that 
torsion, the math gets, whoo, it gets, gets really intense. But fortunately, these design guides make, uh, make your life a little easier. So if any of you are inclined, you could go and download these for free. There's, I think, like, again, there's like 30 of them. Um, and there's, uh, uh, there's some good stuff there. I'm going to show you some stuff from Design Guide 3. Design Guide 3 is uh, uh, on serviceability considerations for, structure and, uh, for structures. And it has a lot of things on deflection limits on drift limits, like how far a building can drift over when it's being subjected to wind or earthquakes or something like that. Um, I have a, a, a table that shows some example deflection limits um, from Design Guide 3. Now, uh, I had mentioned this in concrete design recently, but uh, this is a good point to bring this up. How many of you all have ever been in a house, grew up in a house, or have ever been in a building where you had a plastered roof? Well, well, you know how, how the roof has that sort of plastered, you know, pattern on it? It kind of looks like it's, you know, that rough drip pattern. Everybody know? Have you, have you all seen that? Every, okay, all right. Well, to give you kind of an idea where some of these deflection limits come from, well, if you have a, a roof beam, you have a beam, for instance, that's supporting that, that, that next story, if it deflects too much, that doesn't mean that beam is going to fall down and people on the second story are going to fall through to the first story. But if the beam deflects too much, you might start cracking that plaster. Okay? So you'll notice here some of these deflection limits are actually looking at whether or not you have a, a plastered ceiling or a non-plastered ceiling. And so, for instance, if you're looking at roof members, if you have a non-plastered ceiling, the deflection limit's only L over 240, whereas if it's plastered, we make the limit more stringent. You know, L over 360, that is a more stringent deflection limit than L over 240, because we're dividing by a bigger number. Does that make sense? And if we violate that, again, it doesn't mean that the structure is going to fail, but we do have a, a, a roof that has cracked plaster on it. Somebody's going to have to go in and fix it, and that's going to be some money. The, ultimately, that's not what we as structural engineers desire. So what, the way that we sort of um, go about that is we say, look, here's the deal. We will, um, you know, we'll design for strength factoring loads. And we'll design for service limit states not factoring them, but checking these, uh, these codified or at least suggested limits. And again, if your client wants something different, then your client wants something different. For instance, there, there are uh, instances where you're designing like a, uh, like a hospital, okay? And so you as the structural engineer might need to pay a little bit more attention, say, to the room that's holding the MRI, okay? They don't want that machine to move at all, you know? So that deflection limit might be something like L over 2,000. And, you know, the client is saying they have a very stringent deflection limit, but for a very specific reason. So that's where the code's giving you a, a little bit of freedom. Okay. So, any questions? All right. Now, if you ever are controlled by serviceability, if, uh, you know, if the deflections are an issue, let's go back to good old CE312 structural analysis. If your beam's made out of steel, then we know what the E value is, right? And if you have to select a beam based on its serviceability, what that means is, is you're selecting a beam based off of IX, based off of its moment of inertia. Well, Table 3.3 lists all of the shapes in the manual as a function of their moment of inertia. And what you find is, just like the uh, ZX tables, they're grouped, and the, the one on top is the one that's uh, uh, bolded. That's the one that's the most economical section out of that group. So if you need to design based off of deflections, you're going to be looking off of uh, the IX tables, which is table 3.3. Again, be careful that you're in the right table because there is a similar one for IY if they're being uh, uh, bent along their weak axis. Sound good? Let's do an example. I'm sick of just sitting here talking about it. Let's do some work. Okay. So I have a beam. We'll say it's a 16 by 31. Uh, it's 8992 steel. Now, it's being subjected to a dead load of 450 pounds per foot and a live load of 550 pounds per foot. Now, here's the thing. That dead load does not include the beam self-weight, so we're going to need to account for that. Uh, the beam is 30 foot long. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to calculate the uh, moment capacity. 
We're going to look up the shear capacity, and then we're going to see whether or not this beam uh, will, will meet a serviceability deflection limit of L over 360. Okay? And so this is a very, very typical beam analysis problem. And then depending on what time we have, we might get into a beam design problem uh, as well. Now, the structural analysis that we're doing here is pretty simple. It's just WL squared over 8. But I just want to make sure that everybody's clear that it very well could be something different. It could be a, a, a much uh, more complicated. It's, uh, it's beeping at me. Oh, never mind. We're back. The okay. So W is 16 by 31. Uh, I want to look up some properties for this 16 by 31 just so we're, we're speaking the same language. First off, let's see. So, let's see. sorry. Okay, I want to know what the zx is, and I want to know what the ix is. Somebody tell me what the zx and the ix values are for a 16 by 31. Okay, so 375, and I heard 54. Now let's make sure we get the units on that. What's the ZX? Inches cubed, and this is there we, to the fourth. There we go. All right. Um, another thing that I'm going to ask you all to go ahead and tell me is the BF over 2TF and the H over TW. I'm not going to use it right now. We'll use it at the very end, but somebody tell me what we're getting here. Somebody else. Okay, so your BF over TF is like 6 .28. 6 .28. Now, what are the units on that? There are none. Yeah, it's unitless. Okay, somebody else, the H over TW, making sure y'all are paying attention. Say it again. 51.6. Okay. Typically what you'll find is that your H over, or your, your sections your, that are beams are deeper, so it's not that uh, surprising that your H over TWs are a little bit bigger than they were for columns. Okay. Okay. First thing we're going to do is the structural analysis. So ultimately what we have is a beam that's being loaded, you know, like this. And so this is essentially our structural analysis model. So it, if you can't do this, then, then I failed as, as a professor, okay? Now, remind me, what are the dead loads? Did I miss something? What are the dead loads and live loads on this beam? Four hundred fifty pounds per foot, and the live load. There we go. Now, what was the thing about that dead load? What did it say? It said it wasn't including the beam self weight. So, without doing any math, what is the beam self weight? It's 31 pounds per foot. Why is it 31 pounds per foot? Because it's a W16 by 31. Okay, so I, I tend to refer to that as W sub naught, and that is 31 pounds per foot. So therefore, W sub U is 1.2 times W naught plus W sub dead plus 1.6 W L. So 1.2 times 
Say it again. 1420. 1420? Did you count your 31? Say it again. What'd you get? What? What? Yeah, just yeah, just a distributed load. So, so somebody, I heard something else. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. So here's let let's go back to our little image up here. This is fourteen fifty seven pounds per foot, and that's factored, and everything's accounted for, and the beam is thirty foot long, right? Now, we're in design mode, okay? In design mode, uh, or well, actually, no, no, let me take that back. We're, we, we're looking, at, uh, design mode's the wrong word. We're in strength mode. So what we are looking at is, for strength, we're looking at moment capacity, or we're looking at shear capacity. So let me ask you this. If I have a beam that has 1,457 pounds per foot, and it's 30 foot long, how do I determine the maximum shear and how do I determine the maximum moment? Well, hold on. Hold on. Now, let's, let's refer to that. Okay? I'm actually going to pull the slide up. Okay, what page are you on? So if, if I was a betting man, you're looking, where is it? Right here. You're looking at this. Okay, let, let's, let's do this. Let's put this on the... Let's put this on here. I want to make this kind of big so everybody can see what we're talking about. Woo, okay, that was, that's pretty big. Okay, so you're looking at a simply supported beam with a uniformly distributed load. Now, you pulled this equation here, right? Okay, all right, so, yeah, let's elaborate on that. So, what, what is this the equation of if I were to graph that? That's the equation of a, a line, right? Which is why, you know, we have, you know, you know it's, a, it's a line with negative slope. That's, that V sub X is the equation of this line. But that doesn't tell us, I mean, what we're after is the maximum. So what is the maximum shear? It's whatever this is, which is WL over 2. And as for the maximum moment, here's our moment diagram. M, of X, M sub X will tell us the moment at any point. But what we're really after is the moment at L over 2. So plug in L over 2 right here for x, and you get WL squared over 8. Everybody with me on this? Any questions? All right. Okay, so this is going to be WL over 2, and this is WL squared over 8. And again, if this is too much, don't, don't worry. Just break out the structural analysis. Draw the shear diagram and draw the moment diagram. So this is 1457.2 pounds per foot times 30 foot, bless you, over 2, 1457.2 pounds per foot times 30 feet squared over 8. And so, somebody tell me what the shear is, somebody tell me what the moment is. Do the shear first. Twenty one point eight six kips. So what you probably got is something like twenty one eight sixty pounds, which is twenty one point eight six kips. Do I have a second on that? Okay, now what about the moment? One sixty three point nine what? Okay, so that's uh one six three nine hundred foot pounds, which is 163.9 foot kips. Is everybody okay with that? Do I have a second? Okay. Okay, so 
That's the structural analysis. Now, what, and again, what we're ultimately after is the, the, the demand. You know, I have here the moment, but it could be the moment this year, what have you. That's the demand. Now let's look at the capacity. We have a continuously braced beam in this example. So LB is zero, so our capacity is phi FY ZX. Now we're going to go ahead and chug it out, and then we'll compare it against what's in the table. So let's look at capacity. So first off, phi MN is phi FY ZX. Now we're dealing with A992 steel. We didn't look up the FY, but this is A992 steel. Does anybody know what FY is right off the top of your head for A992? 50. Okay. So 0 0.9 times 50 KSI times, what was ZX again? 54.0 inches to the third. And so what does that come out? First off, what are the units going to be if I just straight multiply that product out? Inch kip. So tell me what that value is. Okay, and what is that going to be in foot kips? Do I have a second on that? All right. So just to make sure that we're comparing apples to apples, we have MU is 163.9 foot kips, and we have FMN is 202.5 foot kips. Tell me, what, what do you get from those two values? What do you interpret? We're good, yeah. The, the capacity is much larger than the applied moment, so we're good. Now, 202.5. Is that, what's, is that what's listed in Table 3-2? Now let's, let's do that. Let's go to Table 3-2 and let's see if we can find this section. Now, just so you're aware, this may or may not be a bolded line. It's okay if it's not. It is very possible, especially when you're doing discreetly braced beam design, that you end up picking a section that's not bolded. That's very possible, so just be aware of that. So table 3-2 says that phi MPX is what? 203 foot kips. So that at the very least validates what we just computed. But while we're at it, I want you to tell me for that section, what is this value? One thirty one what? Does everybody see that? So let's make a similar comparison. What was VU? Remind me. 21 point, not, something like that. And what was VVN? What did we just get? 131 kip. So are we good? Not only are we good, we're really good. Okay. Steel beams in buildings and most typical building applications just have ginormous shear capacities and it's just the way that steel beams are they just tend to be rolled with fairly thick webs and their shear capacities through the roof so for now we're just going to look this value up near the end I'll show you how do you actually compute the shear capacity it's pretty straightforward uh, a little spoiler alert this little remember that whole 0 0.6 remember that 0 0.6 that shows up every time a value of shear or something's in shear well that 0 0.6 shows up uh, as well. So just something to keep in mind. Okay, so at the very least we know that the beam meets not only um, uh, moment limits but shear limits. Okay, let's look at deflection.
Now I'm going to do this like I would a typical problem from CE 312, from good old structural analysis. All right. So we have a live load of 0.55 kips per foot. We have a beam that's 30 foot long. We have an E value of what? There we go. And then we have a moment of inertia of, remind me, what was that value? All right. Now, if you're in concrete design, you're not allowed to answer my next question. Well, actually, my next couple questions. What is the, the formula for deflection? And again, if you're in concrete design, you don't get to answer. Why? Because you just were looking at this a little bit ago. So what's the formula for deflection? Well, you have a manual in front. You can look it up. Oh, Miss, Miss Smith, Mrs. Smith, you're getting the, the next question. Oh, yeah, you will. I believe in you. Okay, do y'all remember this formula? For those of you that aren't in concrete design right now, y'all remember this? I know you've seen it. Now, you, 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 hold on, I, I, I got a question for you back here. Now, first off, notice how when I plug and chug, I'm not using load factors. I'm not plugging in like 1.6 times the live. Everybody pay attention, pay attention. So we have, everybody pay attention. So we got 5 times 0 0.55 kips per foot, 30 foot to the fourth, then 384, we have 29,000 KSI, we have 375 inches to the fourth. Now, does anybody see a problem? No. I don't think she heard you there, so we'll see. I know. I'm asking you, how do you fix it? There, there's. <laughs> I think you're off the hook for now. For now, we have some differential equations later. I'll I'll ask some questions on that for everybody. Do you remember this from structural analysis? Remember when you were computing deflections, you would multiply your unit conversion by 1728, and if you were doing rotations, it was 144 times 180 over pi. Y'all remember that? So. Doing the same thing here, and what is my what is my deflection that I'm computing? 0 0.922 inches. We'll need a second on that, given everything's going on with this problem. All right. Now that is our live load deflection. We need to determine what is our maximum deflection. Now the maximum deflection for this problem is stated as L over 360. And so, by and large, this is going to be something from here on out that is stated at the onset of the problem. In other words, the client is telling you this is the, the limit on deflection. Okay? So the deflection limit is going to be 30 over 360, but in order to compare apples to apples, what should I do to this? There we go. And so what does this come out to be? 30 times 12 is 360, divided by 360 is 1 inch. So are we good? Yeah, the beam is only deflecting 0.922, so its deflection you know, that it's experiencing is 0 0.922, and its maximum deflection is 1 inch. Yes? Uh, 
I am glad you asked that. That is a wonderful question. So, the question was, why can you compute the live load deflection directly in here, but not in concrete? If you remember from concrete design, you can't compute the dead or the live load deflection directly. You have to compute the dead plus the live, and then the dead, and then take the difference. So why can you do this in here, but not in concrete design? There's a very simple answer. Steel beams don't crack. Re if you remember, more load causes more, <laughs> more load <laughs> causes more cracking in a reinforced concrete beam. So you can't compute that live load deflection directly. You have to compute the effect of the dead load and the effect of the dead plus the live and take the difference. But steel beams don't experience that. Steel is a very linear material. So we can just compute the live load deflection directly because we don't have that cracking phenomenon to exp that we have to deal with. So, so yeah. Deflections are a lot easier in here than they are in, in concrete. They were a to-do in concrete. In here, they're just, oh, just plug and chug. Yes? All right. Now, that's another good question. Why? Hold on. Y'all need to pay attention. He asked, um, why are we not worried about the dead load? There's a simple answer. We can get around that. Okay. The simplest way of getting around dead load deflection in steel is to engage in a process called cambering. Bless you. So here's how cambering works. Okay, let's say you have a beam and you compute the dead load deflection. Let's just make up a number. Let's say it deflects 0 0.6 inches. Okay, so how do you handle dead load deflection? Simple. You take that beam and you actually bend it upwards 0.6 inches. So when you get, like, if here's your, your beam on site, it's actually bent upwards. And then when you set it on the supports, it deflects, right? But it deflects down 0.6 inches. So after you set it on the support and after it deflects, it's flat. That's called cambering. That's another, oh, that's another great question. What about long-term effects? Steel doesn't undergo creep or shrinkage or anything like concrete does. So we really don't have to worry about that either. <laughs> what is this? So is it one of those, like, it wasn't specifically on the notes, it was what Dr. Michelson said? So, so I guess my, my follow-up would be, so I guess what I say isn't important, it's just what I type? <laughs> oh, you all just wait for this file. <laughs> yes, it could very well be on the exam. Hold on, we got a couple minutes. Oh, what was that question again? What about slenderness? What about slenderness? Wonderful question. We're going to address that question next time. We ran out of time. That's all I got. Yeah. Well, no.